We asked Grover next about his recent research on Lenin's last writings and the so-called Last Testament of Lenin. Briefly put, um, some of the last writings of Lenin, so-called, um, are sharply critical of Stalin and uh, appear to be sympathetic to Trotsky. Uh, these were the genuineness of these documents was not questioned uh, at the time. That is to say, uh, while Lenin was alive and certainly uh, after he died, uh, it uh, was featured by Khrushchev. Khrushchev, these these documents were suppressed, but they were not emphasized. Khrushchev emphasized them. Gorbachev even more so. The Trotskyists, of course, were delighted uh, by, by documents reported by Lenin. Lenin appears to choose to side with Trotsky and Stalin. Um, after the end of the Soviet Union, uh, some of the primary, these, these documents in the primary source form, these archival originals, were um, available to Russian scholars. Uh, one Russian scholar, one, a professor at Moscow University, Valentin Sakharov, no relation to Dmitry Sakharov, dissident, as the Soviet Union, uh, Professor Sakharov, professor at Moscow State University, uh, got access to the primary documents of some of these documents and showed that there, there are a lot of problems. Not only their contents, but also their physical, physical documents themselves. Uh, changes, additions, uh, deletions, very interesting stuff. And as a result, uh, he began to research. Uh, eventually, around 2002, uh, he finished his doctoral research on this subject, and it was published as a book, you know, revised, out, uh, published as a book by Moscow University Press in 2002. And um, it's 700 pages long, Russian, of course, and it is devastating. The evidence that he has and the arguments that he solicits, elicits in his book are devastating. He shows that doc, precisely the documents that appear to be in Stalin, Trotsky, Lenin's last writings uh, are false, are fakes. And they were faked at that time. Now, he also published a few sort of short summary articles about all of this, but short summary articles can't really give evidence, statements. When that book came out in 2003, I bought a copy. Um, and since then, it's been put online. It's been scanned, OCR, put online, and HTML, and PDF. Uh, it's widely available now don't have to have a physical copy. Uh, but, of course, it isn't very widely read. You know, you're talking about a 700-page book, very, uh, very scholarly, full of, of footnotes, uh, not, I would say, not very clearly written, a uh, style that the academics write in, which is lucid in, in places. Uh, and, um, and of course, not translated. Um, I read a bit of it years ago when I bought the book and I set it aside and I said, oh, well, someday I've got this. Well, in 2014, a Princeton professor named Steve Kotkin, uh, who is, I would say, very top 
in the world of uh, researchers on the Stalin period, one of the top, you know, academic anti-communist researchers of the Soviet period, of the Stalin period. Stephen Kotkin published volume one of a projected three-volume biography of Stalin. As it uh, goes up to, eight, to 1920. And in that very interesting biography, of course, it's full of anti Stalin, you know, anti communist asides and statements, but, but in many respects, it's not bad. But one of the striking things about it is he studied Sakharov's 700 page book very, very carefully. And he agrees with it, so that in that volume one of Kotkin's biography of Stalin, uh, he uh, utilizes Sakharov's research and agrees with Sakharov's conclusions. These documents that uh, were in Lenin uh, appears to, in the documents, uh, is very critical of Stalin wants Stalin removed from the office of general secretary and appears to side with Trotsky. Uh, Kotkin agrees with Sakharov that these documents are fake. Um, now that's pretty striking because Kotkin's an anti-communist. In, ge in general, these documents have been a risk for the mill for anti-communists. And of course, they're, they're, they're the I would say the foundation stones on which the Trotskyist movement worldwide is based. Uh, without those documents, uh, Trotsky's claim to be the successor, but, uh, Lenin's chosen successor to Lenin himself, uh, disappears. So, uh, a, f a year ago, more than that, maybe two years ago, as I was concluding a different research project, uh, I decided that I, I really had to go back and study Sakharov's book uh, on Lenin's last writings myself. And I realized this would be a big, big job. It's not just a question of reading the book, it's a question of studying it, it's a question of making careful notes on it, it's a question of looking up many of secondary sources, many of the sources, the sites, checking them. Uh, it's going to be a big project. And I'm about three quarters of the way through that project now. And during this year, uh, 2020, I hope to draft a book on this subject, which will not represent my own independent research, nothing that I have uh, discovered independently of others, but really, in most respects, it will be a popularization and to some extent a reorganization of Sakharov's research. Because if I don't do it, I don't know who's going to do it. And the political and historical um, uh, implications of the fact that these documents that uh, are anti-Stalin and pro-Trotsky uh, by Lenin are false, fakes, uh, is uh, significant. Significant for the left, but it's significant, uh, significant general. I should mention that Kotkin had a had a motive for seizing on Sakharov's uh, conclusions, uh, although I think he was correct to seize on them. His motive is to psychoanalyze Stalin. Uh, Kotkin comes to the conclusion that Stalin uh, was driven paranoid by these documents. And therefore, in volume two of Kotkin's projected three volume biography, uh, Kotkin says, well, it's Stalin's paranoia is what caused him to kill all these people, to, to accuse all of these people, all of these uh, old communists of, of, of collaboration, conspiracies, have them executed, so forth and so on. Uh, this paranoia uh, is responsible for Stalin's uh, atrocities of the 1920s. Uh, 
1930s. Now that's all wrong, completely. Uh, Kotkin in his, Kotkin's own historiography is poisoned by this notion of psychohistory. I think in part because uh, perhaps his most influential professor at Princeton was a, uh, I think Robert Tucker, who was not dead, but who was, uh, who wrote a psycho history of Stalin back in the 1970s. Terrible, uh, intellectually dishonest, worthless history, but evidently was a major, major influence on Kotkin. But for whatever, but for that or for some other reason, Kotkin does endorse Sakharov's research in uh, volume one of his history, uh, in his biography of Stalin. And so I'm working hard on this, and I'm going to come out with a book on it next year or so. I should say one more thing about this. In the late 1960s, a, Soviet, a scholar of the Soviet Union uh, uh, published a book called uh, Lenin's Last Struggle. This was a man named Moshe Lewin. He is now dead. But he was a prominent scholar, anti-communist scholar in the Soviet Union. And Lewin had been raised in the Soviet Union uh, on a collective farm. So, you know, he was not only a Russian, but he also had some personal knowledge of the Soviet Union. Uh, Lewin wrote this book, Lenin's Last Struggle, uh, assuming that these last documents of Lenin's were all genuine. The reason he assumed them as being genuine was because uh, in the earlier 1960s, the fifth edition, uh, the full complete edition, as it's called in Russian, of uh, Lenin's works was published by the Institute of Marxism in Moscow. But it was the Khrushchev period and the, the volumes uh, that were published about Lenin's last writings uh, during that period of time by the Institute of Marxism and Leninism under Khrushchev falsify some of these documents in conformity with Khrushchev's attacks on Stalin. Khrushchev is trying to uphold Lenin, but trying to attack Stalin's reputation. No. Lewin um, took the versions of these documents of the commentaries on them that were published in this fifth edition of Khrushchev took them at face value. And he wrote this book called Lenin's Last Struggle and comes to conclusions in there that are very agreeable, not so much to the bourgeois, uh, anti-communist, pro-capitalist historians, but to Trotsky's. So he comes to the conclusion that uh, certainly Lenin would have endorsed Trotsky as the leader of the Soviet Union and, and gotten rid of Stalin as a, a prominent Soviet leader had he lived. And uh, this, is a, this is a book that, is, that continues to be very influential. It was actually reprinted um, 15 or 20 years ago, um, uh, but it was simply reprinted. There are errors in it, I mean, factual errors, spelling errors. That were not even that, that were not even correct. It was simply reprinted with a new introduction by some you know, more more recent Soviet scholars. So it's a book that that continues to be influential. And uh, so for all these reasons, I think that a, a study of these last documents and, a, and an attempt to popularize, to make available to people who are not prepared to or able to read a 700-page densely written scholarly work in Russian is an important uh, enterprise, and that's what I'm working on now. Uh, and I hope to publish it, let's say, let's put a, let's say 2021. So. On the topic of reading materials for listeners to delve into, we asked Grover about any books he'd recommend, including about the young Stalin. Well, 
Well, okay, let me deal with that. There is no evidence that Stalin was involved in the Tiflis bank robbery or gold train robbery in 1906. Uh, it is often stated that he was involved, but there is no evidence that he was involved. I'm not saying he wasn't involved. There's simply no evidence that he was. Uh, Simon de Montefiore states outright that he was. Um, Kotkin does not does not insist one way or the other. He sort of assumes that Stalin must have had something, but um, but doesn't really uh, doesn't really deal in length with that. So I wouldn't. I, I think that um, one should not simply assume. That Stalin was involved in that particular heist. Uh, much of the money, I'm not even sure where it went. Uh, did it end up in the Bolshevik coffers? I'm not sure. It makes a great, uh, you know, it makes a great story if you're interested in portraying the Bolsheviks as basically thugs and criminals. That's really what Simon de Montefiore does in Young Stalin. Um, there are no good biographies of Stalin. That is to say, they all reflect the anti-Stalin paradigm. There are no good histories of the Soviet Union. That is to say, they all reflect the anti-Stalin paradigm. Uh, the ones that the books that were written during the Stalin period, some of them are certainly worth reading. But as you would expect, they are a one-sided, uh, one-sided about the successes of the Soviet. Uh, and uh, do not deal with the contradictions in it thoroughly. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, therefore, they're, from, uh, from, a point of, from our point of view today, they're, uh, they're outdated. But at least they're not anti, they're not dominated by the anti Stalin paradigm. You know, some of them may be dominated by the pro Stalin paradigm, but for the most part, they're not. Good books include um, those by Andrew Rothstein. I'm sure he's a figure familiar with there in the UK. Well, you're not in the UK. He wrote in the UK. Uh, his history of Soviet Russia, which only covers the Stalin period, is, is not bad, although it's one-sided and outdated. Uh, the book by Sayers and Khan called uh, The Great Conspiracy uh, is very accurate. Um, it does not include a lot of the evidence, a lot more evidence than we have today about the conspirators, about Trotsky, about the, the, those who were guilty of the Moscow trials and others. It, it omits, it, it really reflects the official pro, the official Soviet view as it was in, let's say, 1945-46. Uh, it's still worth reading to give you uh, an idea of the scope of the anti-communist uh, attacks by the, by the communist forces, by the Western forces against the Soviet Union. But in general, there is no good history of the Soviet Union because of the Stalin paradigm. I have to say that um, if you want to just start to discover the truth about Soviet history, particularly of the Stalin period, you have to read the books that I have written. And I've written those books because I have discovered that the Soviet history, history of the Soviet Union of this period is falsified to an almost unbelievable extent. And therefore, and as far as I know, there are nobody, nobody else is, is doing this kind of work. That's a sad statement. And uh, I hope that others will pick it up and start doing it. But uh, I can't, I can't say otherwise. For example, I wrote a book called Yezhov versus Stalin, which is about the so-called Great Terror, although I dismantle that term in the book. It's about the period of Yezhov's uh, mass, mass murder of Soviet citizens in 1978, and I go into the primary source evidence. Uh, there are a number of other fairly recent books about that period. All of them are completely dishonest, either dishonest or incompetent, probably the two feed into one another, uh, dishonesty and confidence. They're, they're just really uh, worthless stuff, you know. Very, very, uh, very false, um, very misleading. Uh, so uh, I recommend that you 
lot and get some of my books. By the way, some of them, if you scout around on the internet, are available for download for free. I didn't make them available for download for free. Some other people have scanned them and put them on the internet sometimes. They didn't ask me, but hey, as long as they're there, if you don't mind reading books in a digital format, you can download them for nothing. Otherwise, they are available now in Europe through the Amazon outlets in Europe, which means you can get them without having to pay the shipping prices from the United States that up until 18 months ago or so, you did have to pay. It used to be that if somebody in Europe or Asia or India, uh, South America wanted to read one of my books, they had to really pay double the price. They had to pay for the price of the books and then they had to pay the shipping costs, which basically doubled the price. Now that's not the case. Uh, Amazon carries all these books in uh, in uh, all of its uh, European outlets, uh, Australia, uh, and uh, you know that that makes them very widely available. But there really is nothing good about the Stalin period. I mean, there are good studies of specific questions. I have to recommend Mark Tauger's research, T A U G E R research, which I use and praise. Of, I think very highly of it about Soviet agriculture. I think it's very good. Halger is not pro-communist in the slightest. Um, he, you know, he makes some occasional makes some negative remarks about Stalin this and Stalin that. But I mean, his research is really excellent, and he sticks to the evidence. He's the best researcher on Soviet ag agriculture. He's the best researcher on famine and on collectivization. Um, there are a few researchers like that. I don't have not researched World War II. Uh, I don't want to get into that, uh, that uh, morass of uh, stuff, uh, researching battles and strategies, which general made the correct decisions and which ones didn't. Uh, so I can't, I don't have anything to say about that. Uh, and there are no good books about Soviet history from the end of World War II to the death of Stalin either. So uh, I'm afraid that I have to uh, recommend uh, my own books, which are not expensive. And uh, if you read them, you will see uh, the extent of the dishonesty of mainstream Soviet studies. And let me just say one more thing about that. My first real book in English about all of this is called Khrushchev Live, and it's the evidence that Khrushchev in his famous secret speech, his anti-Stalin speech, at the 20th Party Congress of February 1996, that uh, every accusation he made against Stalin is false. Every one. Uh, well, there's one that I couldn't prove true or false. It's very minor. Uh, basically, it's all false. Now, that book is well known in the field of Soviet studies, but it's never referred to. The fact that Khrushchev lied in that speech is well known by mainstream researchers all over the world, field of Soviet studies. They never mention it. And they never mention it. I think it's no miracle that they don't, because that's the beginning of the unraveling of the anti Stalin period. So, with that level of dishonesty going on in the field of Soviet studies, I can't recommend anything but my own works. And by the way, I don't make a cent on any of my books. I don't get any royalties. I don't, uh, the publishers don't pay me anything. Um, my publishers are small left-wing publishers. They make a little bit of money, or at least they, they pay for their own labor. Um, I write these books because I think it's an important thing to do. And somebody goes out and buys a copy of my book, not one red set of that will come to me. We finally asked Grover about the political criticisms that the Maoist and Hojaist trends of Marxism made of Stalin. I don't know anything about what Hoja had to say or didn't have to say. I've never read books. <clears throat> so I don't make any, I don't know about that. I can talk about Mao a little bit. All right. Uh, the Soviet Union was giving tremendous aid to China in the first and during the 1950s okay particularly during stalin's life then khrushchev's secret speech came out and this really knocked the world communist movement for a loop uh, 
around the world during the next year or two, uh, half, at least half of the co communists and all the different communist parties quit, the co quit their own communist parties, not including Eastern Europe and China. Um, in China, uh, the Mao leadership at first sort of, you know, in a kind of knee-jerk manner said, yes, we support what uh, Chairman Kuchik said. Then they started to backtrack and started to say that they did not approve of what Kuchik said. Uh, this led to what became known as the Sino-Soviet dispute. And it also led to Khrushchev abruptly, in the late 1950s, withdrawing all Soviet money and, with, and uh, repatriating all the Soviet uh, technical experts, engineers and others, who were helping the industrializing China. Now, China had up until that point basically been following what we might usefully call the Soviet model or the Stalin model. That is to say, how do you build a modern state? You collectivize agriculture and you industrialize without foreign investment. And that's what China had been doing. And just as what happened in the Soviet Union in the middle of this process in 1953 with the famine, so in China in 1958 to 61, there was a big famine. We don't know exactly how big, but it was significant enough so that other leaders in the Chinese Communist Party, because of course Mao was no dictator, either, um, questioned Mao's leadership, questioned the, uh, either explicitly or implicitly the Soviet model of what we might call building socialist modernization. And um, Mao backtracked somewhat. Uh, so, as we get uh, leaping ahead without reviewing all of that, we can see that after Mao's death, the Soviet model was set aside, right, under Deng Xiaoping. And since then, uh, the Chinese Communist Party decided to industrialize with foreign development. But let's get back to Mao. Mao, because of Khrushchev's betrayal of uh, his promises, the Soviet promises to help China, and of course because Stalin had been helping China, uh, and because Mao disagreed with the political direction that Khrushchev's politics were going, for example, peaceful coexistence, achievement of socialism with peaceful coexistence, uh, Mao became more and more hostile, the leadership of the Communist Party became more China became more and more hostile to the Soviet leadership. Khrushchev leadership. But, but Mao did not have the evidence we have now. He did not know, he could not prove that Khrushchev had lied in that speech. So in his remarks about Stalin, uh, which were made in the early 60s, but not published, I think, until after his death, or at least maybe during the Cultural Revolution, maybe that's back, published during the Cultural Revolution uh, in an unofficial manner, uh, Mao made some statements about Stalin based upon the assumption that Khrushchev's statements in his secret speech were accurate. Mao did not know that they were not accurate. Mao estimated Khrushchev's politics from what he could see, you know, Khrushchev's changing his policies, and he didn't like it, and assumed that that came from Khrushchev having, uh, having misevaluated, having uh, mistakenly evaluated or deliberately misevaluated Stalin's legacy. But Mao did not really know what Stalin's legacy was because Khrushchev had lied about it and Mao didn't know he was lying. So Mao's statements about Stalin in those works written in the early 1960s, which you now find all over the place, are not accurate. He is assuming that the Khrushchev analysis of Stalin was wrong, but that Khrushchev's factual statements about Stalin were correct, and that's not true. So, had Khrushchev not made that speech, I think China, China would have continued to industrialize in the same manner as it was doing in, let's say, up to 1950. 
1957, following, broadly speaking, the Soviet economy. <coughs> Pardon me. And that would have made the history of communist China dramatically different from what it has been. And finally, let me say this one last thing. Um, I want to repeat that there were problems with the Stalin model of building communism through uh, socialism. The, it was assumed that socialism would lead to communism. That was uh, the, a fundamental assumption of the whole communist movement, certainly of Stalin's Soviet Union. That didn't happen. Uh, instead of producing uh, a communist society, Stalin, the Soviet Union, Stalin, the Communist Party, and Stalin produced Khrushchev, produced a, a whole generation and several generations of Soviet leaders who wanted to move away from, uh, from more egalitarianism or, or from uh, moving more and more towards communism and away from communism, and ultimately with the results that we ultimately see Gorbachev, who, who is a, you know, not only was incompetent in other respects, obviously, back on it, but who clearly didn't know anything about Marxism. Leonard, how did a person like this become head of the Soviet Communist Party? Clearly, there's nothing about Marxism, nothing about Lenin, nothing about Soviet economics, history. Um, that these people, uh, particularly Khrushchev and his act, his cronies, were all all came in, into prominence under Stalin. So there's something fundamentally, there's some fundamental problems with the Stalin concept, of how to build communism, that uh, are yet to be fully appreciated, fully analyzed. And uh, obviously we can't discuss it here and now, but, uh, that, but that needs to be reevaluated. We can't simply go back and affirm Stalin and Stalin's acts or the, uh, the, the uh, developments in the Soviet Union can't be unequivocally confirmed. We need to also critically evaluate them and ultimately discover why they went wrong.